Thanks for coming back and joining us again. We are in the third session of the Farm to Table Trade Meeting, Wholesale Opportunities for Local Producers. And um, just to kind of give a little bit of orientation, what to expect, um, we will be using um, the chat function throughout this session. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, send them to our hosts. Um, if we have time at the end, then we will take some questions and answers. Um, we're also going to put a couple of polls out to the group. And um, the first one is just going to be to find out who is in the room. Um, so as people filter in, um, I'm going to give a, another minute, but um, we're going to ask, you know, are you a producer? Are you a buyer? Um, and just get a sense of who's here and we'll share that back out to the group. So you should see that poll pop up on your screen and go ahead and take a second to fill that in and send off your answer. Appreciate it. more seconds. And we have a great group today. Um, we have a panelist uh, panel group. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to check out um, on the Sustainable Connections event page, um, all of the bios for all of our uh, panelists are listed there. I'm going to post that in the chat. If anybody's curious, we want to visit it later. Um, and we'll also be sharing out information from the entire day and a whole bunch of resources. But um, if you're curious, you can take a look at the um, bios of all of our panelists today. And um, so I think We've got everyone answered the poll. Um, and Elias, does this get shared out or do I just read it out? Sorry, I haven't done this before. I'm, I'm not actually sure, to be honest. Maybe if I click end poll. I don't want it to go away though. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm gonna read it off just in case. Hopefully it shows up afterwards, but... Um, We've got 43% producers in the room, um, farm producers. We have 22% manufactured producers, and then 43% uh, others. Um, and then we have... Uh, People are still completing the second poll. Um, so we'll give that a second. So far, it looks like we have 46% um, of people are selling to wholesale buyers, um, restaurant buyers. 50% are selling to retail buyers. 12% of you are selling to some institutions. 8% are selling to schools. 15% uh, sell or provide to hunger relief organizations. And then we've got other. I'm gonna hit the end pull button and see what that does if that shares out any information to everyone. Did that, oh, here we go, share results, I see. There you go. So that's who's here, which is great. I think we have a great audience for the topics that we have at hand. Um, and we're going to start um, by inviting our first panelist. And that is Annette Slonim of the 
Washington Department of Agriculture, Washington, Washington State Department of Agriculture. And um, sorry, this poll is taking up my presenter view. Thanks for being patient with me. Okay. So uh, we have today Annette. Um, she's here from the Farm to School Purchasing. She is the Farm to School Purchasing Grant Specialist with WSDA's uh, Regional Markets Farm to School Program. She joined WSDA in August of 2022. Oh, that's not quite right. 2021, I think. Is that right, Annette? Uh, after graduating from the University of Washington with a master's in public administration, Annette has over seven years of farm to school and local food system experience, including work for a local food hub, doing outreach and sales to schools and other institutions. She will be sharing with us about the unprecedented funding and support available both to producers and buyers to support local, local food procurement. Ooh, I am a little tongue-tied after lunch today. Okay, thank you. And um, with that, I'm going to invite Annette to um, join us and I'm going to start sharing your slides. You can just let me know when to advance them. Great, thanks Marissa. Um, it's great to be here. Um, as Marissa mentioned, I am with the Washington State Department of Agriculture's um, Regional Markets Program. Uh, I specifically support our farm to school work, but I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, local procurement opportunities available um, in both the farm to school space and the emergency food assistance space. Um, so the main message that we want to communicate today is that there's quite a bit of money available um, in local purchasing right now supported through um, through state funds, sometimes federal funds. Um, so these are market opportunities for growers in Washington to find buyers that are specifically interested in sourcing or in some cases required to source Washington grown products. Um, altogether, this, re this represents a pool of about $50 million that's available now in purchasing uh, for the next year or two. Um, the first program that I work on is the Farm to School Purchasing Grant Program. Uh, this is a new opportunity. These grants go to uh, schools, child care centers, and summer meal programs, uh, specifically for the purchase of Washington grown foods. And you can access information about the Farm to School program and those grants through the, the URL that you see there. Um, the rest of the programs that are on this slide, Farm to Food Pantry, TFAP, and the We Feed Wild Pilot Food Program are, um, again, purchasing opportunities. These um, grants have gone out to organizations, uh, different types of agencies or organizations that are purchasing food and um, are looking to partner and support um, Washington, uh, Washington producers. Um, some are specifically looking for different types of producers and different types of project products depending on depending on the program. But essentially, they have dollars um, that are available to purchase Washington grown foods and are looking for um, for growers and producers to partner with. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, in addition, in addition to uh, those purchasing opportunities, we also have grant programs available directly to producers. Um, one new program that's open now, it's a pretty fast turnaround. I believe the first deadline is next week, and then there's a second deadline in early March for meat and poultry processing and inspection grants. Um, this is a really good opportunity if you're interested in expanding. Um, meat processing, there's definitely a demand for this in the institutional market. Um, and to, to increase the supply. Um, and we also are going to be launching two new um, local food system infrastructure grant programs, um, and one of specifically prioritizing uh, women, minority, and small business owners. And this is all to um, support the development of our local and regional food systems so that uh, local growers can, can access more direct markets and also wholesale and institutional markets. 
Um, and the, the kind of total pool of funds in here is about 20, a little over $20 million. Again, um, that's going out uh, now over the next couple of years. And next slide. Um, so for those that are not familiar with the WSD and our regional markets program, um, we are here to support the economic viability of small and direct marketing farms and increasing the availability of Washington products in schools and institutions and tables across the state. Um, I know we're here talking about wholesale opportunities, so I'm going to focus on that. Um, we do provide a lot of direct marketing assistance as well. Um, so we offer technical assistance, market access and development, partnerships and promotions, um, outreach and education and resources and publications. Um, both for producers and then also for, for buyers. Um, in particular, I'll, on the farm to school side, we work a lot with schools and districts to um, help them also understand how to, to partner and source from local farms. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of some of the online publications and resources that we have um, for both uh, farmers and buyers. Um, for those on the call today, I want to call out the green book, the handbook for small and direct marketing farms. We have a couple of fact sheets in there that specifically address selling wholesale um, to schools and other institutions. Uh, so you can access that uh, through the URL link that's on the screen. Um, and it's fact sheet 17 for schools and selling to institutions. Next slide. Um, just a couple more examples of ways that we offer support to growers looking to scale up and access wholesale markets, uh, either through one-on-one -on -one phone guidance, email, or in person. Our team is available. Um, I'll have our information on the final slide here, and you can always reach out to us. Um, we offer workshops and presentations um, around some specific uh, opportunities that are available. Uh, in the past, and we do plan to offer more farmer and buyer networking events, in particular for farm to school as well with this new grant, um, and then other, other supports to help um, grow and sustain uh, regional uh, food hubs and value chains. And if you go to the next slide. So here's our information. Um, we're a, a small but growing team. Um, our, many of you may know our, our program manager, Laura Raymond. Um, I support our farm to school work currently. We also have a new local meat marketing and capacity specialist, Alyssa Umars. Um, she is managing that grant program. So if you are interested or have questions, you would reach out to her. Um, Karen Ullman works on our team and is a produce safety specialist and does a lot of our education and outreach training around um, gap in produce safety and things like that. And then all of our business and marketing support for small farms um, and more information around that is available at the URL at the bottom of this screen. So I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you, Annette. Um, if anyone has questions for Annette, um, feel free to pop some in the chat. Um, and we will share all of this contact information out. Um, and Jess, if you're able to pop uh, uh, Annette's contact information into the chat, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so I just want to also back up for a minute and say, while we're here to talk about wholesale opportunities, um, we're not, I, I don't want to gloss over the fact that, like, these are big, complicated um, things that we're trying to um, to do. And when I think back about, you know, five years ago, um, when I started working at Sustainable Connections, a little bit doe-eyed and um, was volunteering with Farm to School and thinking about the possibility of um, local procurement in our public schools, it, it felt really intangible and, and out of reach in a lot of ways. And five years later, you know, we're looking back and um, we have Patrick here and uh, he'll be able to share a little bit about what's happened at, um, in Bellingham, building a central kitchen and being able to um, procure more local food and also just serve our kids scratch made food. Um, it, it, it takes time, but we're making progress and I'm really excited about it. Um, 
And so with that, I just thought I would transition and share that um, with all of these funds and opportunities that are coming down the pipe, um, WSDA and uh, the Eat Local First Collaborative um, teamed up over the past year to try and build some digital infrastructure to support these connections. Um, and we have Mark Bowman here, who's going to share a little bit about um, research that was done on the Olympic Peninsula in terms of identifying what, what the barriers are um, for producers on the peninsula in accessing wholesale markets. And we know it's a challenge. Um, and one of the first things that we have heard from folks is just that it's really hard to access information, to originate a search, um, to even know what's available. And so we, we are fully aware that we are just beginning to scratch the surface of um, building new systems, but that's exactly what we're trying to do. So um, introducing uh, elocalfirst.org, which is not new to some folks in the Northwest, but over the past year, um, we have partnered with six different organizations around the state between Sustainable Connections, uh, the Tilt Alliance, um, WSU Food Systems, Pierce County Fresh, the Local Food Trust, um, and Eat Local First on the Olympic Peninsula, also through WSU Food Systems. We combined our uh, individual food and farm directories to create one resource um, that we could all work together on, not duplicate efforts, but support all types of market channels, everything from individuals to um, the institutional level. Um, if you're not familiar with eatlocalfirst.org, I definitely would encourage you to check it out. Um, inside eatlocalfirst.org is the Washington Food and Farm Finder, which currently houses over 1,750 listings for local farms, food producers, farmers markets, grocers, and restaurants um, that are sourcing locally for their menus. In addition, we also have um, a whole section of local resources, which contains everything from food banks um, to food education and even regional information, whether that's tourist information. Um, so anything that is uh, adjacent to food that's grown, raised, um, harvested or made in Washington um, belongs here. And we hope that um, it proves to be, continue to be a helpful tool. And the next step for that was to build out a beta wholesale product finder tool, which we did with food service professionals, um, particularly school food service programs and hunger relief organizations in mind as we were working with WSDA with all of the funding that Annette mentioned earlier in mind. Um, so if you have not visited yet, the Wholesale Product Finder, we'll put a link in the chat for that. Um, but basically we are trying to assist buyers in making sure that they can search according to their criteria. Um, so this is an example of a farm listing that is completely filled out with wholesale information. Um, you'll see on their wholesale tab, they've listed um, details and sample buyers, as well as um, who they distribute through and um, whether or not they sell seconds. And, um, also being able to identify that they are GAP certified, they have food safety plans, and that they're enthusiastic to sell to schools and hunger relief organizations. Um, and they also have signified that they are interested in forward contracting, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit later in crop planning. Um, additional items that producers can express are you know, whether or not they are able to process at all. Um, so that's just a little bit of a highlight of the work that we've been doing on 
um, the Washington Food and Farm Finder and the Wholesale Product uh, Finder. And I just want to make sure and let everyone know that if you don't already have a listing, um, you can create one for free. Um, just need to register um, with an email address and name and phone number. And um, we are also able to offer technical assistance to help you fill out an optimized selling profile. Um, so that's a big picture overview. We're going to talk a little bit more about this again at the end and through some conversation with our panelists today. But um, I wanted to share that. And with that, I'm going to introduce uh, my friend, Patrick Durgan. Uh, Patrick began his role with Bellingham School District in January of 2016. He was hired as the food director, as the director of food services and executive chef to the lead to lead the food service department in building a centralized kitchen and transforming the program to stretch, scratch cooked meals for all schools in the district. His work experience involves working over 10 years in higher education at Portland State University and most recently at Western Washington University. His passion for, for providing kids healthy and delicious food options truly embodies the vision statement of the Bellingham Good Food Promise, real food made with love. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Marissa. <clears throat> Thanks for being Sound here. is good? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, super. Well, I, I'm just going to try to share a little bit of our story, and then I, I wanted to share a little bit of what it takes to implement local food in a, in a school district. And there is no one answer to that question uh, or to any of those questions that, that come around that. Every district and every food service program is a little bit different. And we all have some of the same guidelines and things that are challenging for us to follow. But we also have some unique uh, circumstances and variables that are, that are uh, unique to each of us and some shared and some very unique. So uh, this this uh, I guess this is a really great uh, way to just to incorporate part of the work I did at Western, which was really trying to find a way to bring an opportunity to farmers, to growers, producers, and find that that channel or avenue into institutional food service. Now, whether that's community colleges, Western Washington University, um, you know, Whatcom Community College, or hospitals, or any other large entities, the numerous school districts around around our county. It's an interesting idea, and it, it's certainly the more uh, we always will say there's always going to be people in hospitals, there's always going to be kids in schools. It's a very, very consistent marketplace as far as customers and, and availability of customers to serve food too. Some of the challenges, of course, are the guidelines that large institutions or large corporations work under, whether that's a procurement procurement specialist rules and regulations, whether it's the uh, purchasing amounts that you're able to purchase under, in our case, federal purchasing guidelines, state guidelines, or local guidelines. They're, they're all those levels are things that we have to consider. Uh, right now, there's a lot of money being out there put towards farm to schools, just like Annette was mentioning, lots of lots of money out there. It's a really wonderful opportunity to start getting into uh, institutional food service, if that's what you're trying to do. The thing that was really challenging, and I know uh, Cheryl Thornton's on this this call or on this uh, 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 call as well, but uh, we we struggled. I struggled in my time up at Western to try to find the best possible model to bring food to institutional uh, institutional operations. And we knew that direct deliveries weren't always going to be the best way to do that. We knew that there was some sort of conglomerate type of a approach that would be a, a really useful way to bring large and small scale farmers into, into play. And really the food hub and a lot of these food hubs and farm partnerships that are that are forming and they're out there is that what it is the best way to bring these types of opportunities to a, to a farmer I always use the analogy like I could buy 400 pounds of carrot from one particular farm on a, on a delivery and I could also buy two pounds of basil from a different farm on the same truck and really create that opportunity for a small farmer at the same time the one thing that's really challenging uh, in our world right now is <clears throat> is how do we make these purchases in a and make them in a way that 
that is allowed under our guidelines. And this is something I've struggled with my whole time here at the school district is, is what are the, what are the restrictor restrictions that we have? What are the complications that we have? And, and learning all the federal procurement rules and guidelines that are out there. Um, I would say it's a really challenging situation for, for a director in a, in a school food operation, because a lot of our districts, uh, don't operate with federal purchasing guidelines in mind. They they use a lot of the state guidelines, which are which are different. So in some ways, it's a learning it's a learning curve for districts as a whole to try to figure out what it is that we are allowed to do in regard to a federal purchasing and trying to do it the right way and, give, and make sure that we're following all the guidelines that are put out uh, for us to follow. Um, there are. There are a lot of, there's a lot of hurdles. There's a lot of learning that we've experienced. And those, those are all things that we're trying to learn so we can share with our counterparts as well in regard to how do we, how do you do this work? What are the easy no brainers decisions that you can make and what are the more challenging ones? And so uh, the story of Bellingham, was, it started 10 years before I even got here. So the, the really the initiative in our community and in our County of trying to, to make uh, our community grown and community raised products uh, available to the, to the marketplace and K through 12 uh, food service is a really, it's a great one. And, but it takes a lot of time. And I think Marissa um, fell on that point a couple of times that it, sometimes it, the growth is slow and sometimes the opportunities come at a slow pace, but it also, it's important to remember that as we do this, as we grow these food, these systems and grow, grow these relationships that we want them to be sustainable in a, in a short-term and a long-term vision and long-term model that we, you know, in far, in regard to our uh, purchasing at a school district, we don't have a lot of money. You know, our, our food cost is very, very low, um, anywhere from $1.25 to in, in this year and the last couple of years up to $1.80 per lunch that we serve, which includes milk that has to be offered at every meal. We offer a all you care to eat salad bar as well within that structure. So when you're talking about a center of the plate serve, you know, you're looking at about an 80 cent to a dollar food cost. So when you're thinking about what goes in onto a center of the plate option, um, the food cost is, is really low. Now, the one thing that is important to remember is that as we have this efficiency of scale, so when we in Bellingham, we serve about 55, 5,600 lunches a day. We have salad bars that give kids lots of opportunity for choice, lots of opportunity for food education. And we can incorporate a small amount of produce grown by a farm and implement that across our district because we're not trying to serve that to every single student that comes through, we want to be able to offer and show some of those local opportunities. So uh, again, when we talk about 5,600 serves, I don't need 5,600 portions of a local fruit or vegetable to be able to serve in my, in my program. We can find ways to kind of maximize the opportunity to spread that love out throughout our program and to make sure that that kids get the opportunity to make a choice. And that's, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, great things that come from kids making choices. And I won't get into all of those reasons, but they are, they're paramount to, to what we do in our program. Now, of course, the growing season. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Marissa. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, I, I'm probably one more minute if you have something and you then I'm going to introduce so, um, Erica and Will. You bet. Some of the variables that you want to consider when you're thinking about getting into food service uh, into institutional is the growing season, of course, is fairly limited. We're in school from September uh, through June, and you know we have a couple of months really in end of fall. That's those are things that are uh, good to remember. Um, value add is necessary for a lot of school districts. Apples, grapes, um, snap peas; those are very easy for a district to implement because it's just a matter of washing and kind of putting out there. Carrots, radishes, broccoli. Allium, squash take a lot more work. So a small district may not be interested in those types of things. Uh, there are always ways to save on packaging. So if you package things bulk as opposed to bunches, bags, and boxes, that might be a good way to save some cost on both ends of those relationships. And in some ways, making really small purchases for a district is the easiest thing to do. A very a small purchase from a farm or, or a group of farms is a really easy place to go. When you start looking at forward contracts that'll put purchasing over ten thousand dollars, things become a little bit more complicated. But those are those are all things worth working through if if the relationship 
relationship is right. And one thing that I always want to stress is I'm not looking for anything free. If you can't make a dollar or a few pennies on your particular item to keep your business afloat, it doesn't do me any good to try to source from you because it's really important that we keep these relationships sustainable and ongoing over the years. So uh, there is so much to get into in regard to this. I'm happy to, to talk through it. I know that there are a lot of great work. There's a lot of great work being done with community partnerships to find ways to help growers and help farmers get through these hurdles and to find the information that they need as easy as possible. Awesome, thank you, Patrick. Um, and now I would like to introduce uh, Will Annette and Erica Lamson. Um, is my screen sharing the right one? Okay, interesting. <laughs> Um, so, yes, I'd like to introduce uh, Will Annette, who has spent um, his entire 30-year career in restaurants, of which the last 15 have been spent as the owner and operator of Pizzazza, a pizzeria in Bellingham. Over time, he has increased Pizzazza's local purchasing from a handful of ingredients to spending between 60 and 80% of the business's total food dollar with local growers and artisan producers. He is passionate about making and serving delicious, accessible, and scratch-made food for everyday people. And Erica Lamson is a nutritionist and food lover. Erica joined Will in the business in 2015 in her professional and personal life Erica's work centers around connecting people to nourishing delicious food. She has diverse experience with many facets of the food, food system, from government to nonprofits to small business ownership. Welcome, Erica and Will. Um, and since we just finished talking with Patrick for a moment about um, you know, his experience getting local food into schools and um, just shared a bit about how much you've been able to do. It's quite quite different, right? Um, I'm wondering, um, yeah, what's your reaction to that and what's the, the progression been like for you in scaling up your food budget for local food? Well, I can start off by saying it's a lot easier for us than it is for Patrick. If we want to purchase something, we just contact the grower and you know work out um, how that's going to get delivered and the payment and everything like that. We don't have um, all the federal and state regulations that Patrick has to deal with, so that's the beauty of being a private business um, where we're able to do that. So. And then I'll let Will speak to how our local buying has ramped up throughout the years. Um, and it's changed pretty dramatically in the 15 years that we've been around. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with availability. So in the beginning, 15 years ago, um, you know, uh, I, uh, I developed relationships with produce growers and, and some, some uh, meat producers as well. Uh, but over the last, you know, probably five or six years, that ability is really ramped up because there's so many other producers um, and farmers um, to be able to choose from, um, like cheese. There's lots of different cheese ma uh, makers and uh, lots of people producing um, meat and uh, lots of farmers producing vegetables. So the, the opportunities are, are uh, far greater than they used to be. Awesome, thank you. And we've talked a little bit throughout the pandemic about what your experience has been like um, in terms of a steady supply chain. Um, I know that you've mentioned not having as big of disruptions as other folks have. I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, so, you know, as, as the second introduction, we do you know, it varies seasonally, but between about 60 to 80% of our food dollars is spent locally. So a lot of those are on our staple items that go into making pizza. So flour, um, Cairn Spring Mills and cheese, Ferndale Farmstead, um, a lot of different meat producers, um, vegetable, etc. And, it, you know, throughout the pandemic as supply chain um, issues came up, our access to those local products was has been completely steady. 
And, um, you know, whereas there, there are quite a few things that we're not able to source locally, and then we experience the same supply chain issues that everybody else has with packaging and and other things. Um, but with these core ingredients that's been really helped stabilize us through the pandemic in terms of our access um, to these things. And so it just, the pandemic really has made clear for us that local purchasing, while it's this like feel good kind of thing and always has been, it's really a necessity when you're dealing with um, the kinds of disruptions and things that um, we've seen with the pandemic um, anytime you have um, more hands in the supply chain, meaning it's, you know, it has various touch points along the way from the time it's grown to the time it's consumed, those are all vulnerabilities um, that can um, disrupt things and make it harder to um, access those goods. So that when Daniel's producing, you know, he's milking cows and making cheese in Ferndale, which is 15 minutes away from our restaurant um, in Bellingham. That's a very short supply chain. Um, and so there's less possibility for the disruptions there. And so it's really, I think for us, it's really made it clear that local buying is a food security issue um, for our collective food security during times like we've seen with the pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is a great time. I'm going to introduce um, Mark, and I think we're going to come back to um, Patrick and Erica in a little bit. But um, I'm going to introduce Mark. Hi. Mark. Uh, Mark has lived and worked in rural communities his entire life. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Agricultural Business from Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Agricultural, Rural Business, and First Nations Lending was his focus for 17 years with the Farm Credit System and Craft 3, and is currently the Sustainable Agricultural Coordinator for North Olympic Development Council, where he works with farmers in Clallam and Jefferson counties, helping them overcome hurdles to growth. Prior to joining NODC, Mark was a rural economic development and lending consultant for seven years, working with small businesses, nonprofits, native CDFIs, and farmers. Mark also owns and operates a goat ranch in Port Angeles, selling meat to restaurants, grocers, and individuals. Welcome, Mark. And wow, that is a lot. You wear a lot of hats. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for being with us. Good. Um, I'm curious, what's your reaction to the the two different um, wholesale buyer situations that we've showcased for folks here? And, and is there anything in particular that stands out that you'd like to share from your experience with NODC? Yeah, uh, actually, I'm, I'm really good, glad to hear that Pizzazz is... Uh, Pizzazza, thank you. I've not been up there before, to, uh, but my mouth is watering thinking about pizza. So um, I'm really excited to go up and try it. But um, I, I'm really glad to hear that they have had uh, steady uh, supply chains and and the importance of those close relationships with uh, local farmers and producers, uh, which has been uh, really key. And, uh, and definitely, uh, issues with the school districts, uh, their, the limitations uh, and guidelines that have been put on them. Everything that has been said has just been so right on. Uh, one thing I'll quickly say is that oh, this last year in ODC with WSU Extension put together a, it's called a Developing Regional Wholesale Markets for Farmers on the Olympic Peninsula. And this is creating local wholesale markets. So we looked at it, we the assessment and barriers and recommendations that came out of that. And uh, a, a couple of, of key things that uh, I really wanna summarize, which kind of speaks to some of these issues. Um, so we interviewed buyers uh, of product, restaurants and grocers and institutional buyers. We uh, interviewed farmers in the two counties. And some of the things that came up with it, um, there were some of the issues, you know, why is there barriers between more buying and selling of local products to local, uh, 
restaurants, grocers, and institutions. So uh, a couple of things that came out of this is really interesting looking at both sides. One is that um, time, labor, and fuel are, are, um, are intensive for producers to deliver multiple small orders to multiple buyers across the Olympic Peninsula. So if I, you know, I'm a grower and I have um, uh, several restaurants, um, how to coordinate all those deliveries on the same day in the right order um, and um, how to organize all of that. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of work and effort. Um, how to, if I'm a buyer at a um, grocery store, organizing and understanding various fresh sheets that come in from various producers. You know, uh, so, and uh, formatting and organizing the way that product comes in from various producers to these uh, to these grocers. So there's just a lot of, uh, you know, little barriers uh, in the way of, of making things smooth. Uh, one thing that came up is one of the things we saw is selling to certain buyers requires uh, FISMA, GAP, or, or GMP standards, and also liability insurance. So, you know, there's those costs involved. But in order to reach out to some of those maybe larger markets or some of those buyers, uh, is is really important. So, those are just some of the things that have uh, uh, that have come out of the the survey of of issues and trying to learn from both sides to overcome these gaps. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to now introduce uh, Lupita and Gerardo, and then we're going to have more of a collective discussion together. Um, so I'm just going to go back here. Hey, please welcome my friends, Lupita and Gerardo, Lupita Nava obtained a degree in informatics from the University of Nuevo Leonin Monterrey. I don't know if I said that properly, but that's my best effort, um, Mexico, and has worked for corporations like Coca-Cola as a systems analyst. Lupita and her husband owned and operated a corn tortilla factory in Monterrey, Mexico, prior to relocating to Washington State in 1997. While caring for her young family, she worked in the Nooksack and Linden School Districts as a teacher assistant until opening Functional Foods, where she wears many hats, from bookkeeper to production coordinator. And what she loves the most is sales. Lupita has held the value of nutrition at her core, and ha she has done for her family for many years she now wants to do for the community. Gerardo Cruz Castro obtained his degree in BSc Systems from the University of Nuevo León in Monterrey, Mexico. Gerardo has worked in many different industries ranging from chemical to mining to commercial aerospace and currently works in the organic industry. He has extensive experience in project planning, facilities design and construction and installation and operation qualification. Gerardo supports functional foods in regulatory compliance and acts as the representative with FDA and WSDA. Together with their family, they own and operate Tortillas Con Madre, producing delicious, organic, vegan tortillas that can be found from Blaine down to Seattle in grocery stores like PCC, Hagen, Community Food Co-op, and on several restaurant menus as well. Welcome, Lupita and Gerardo. Did I miss anything? Is there anything you have quite the extensive bio? Well, no, I think you're yeah, you're fine. <laughs> you yeah. cover everything. Yeah, it was a very comprehensive introduction. Thank you very much, Marcy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I wondered if you could give us a snapshot um, of you know your business from beginning to where you find yourself now. Um, just, yeah, a couple minutes about how things have evolved for you. Yes, we can. You want me to? All right. So yeah, we we started this venture as a in a in a house conversation, like perhaps many businesses are born, you know, over a table conversation. We we were casually chatting about our interests, you know, in life. And Lupita, as you mentioned, has always 
we've been trying to, to, to share uh, healthy alternatives, especially with the family. And, and one day, you know, I was just praising her, her meal and said, you know, these tortillas that you're making up with family are delicious. I think you should take it beyond our family. I think you should, you can do something with this. And so the whole conversation turned out into a proposition. You know, I said, hey, do you think that if, if you have the interest in making this a little bigger, if, if I support you, we can go ahead together and, and venture into this. And, and that became, you know, tortillas tomato. And luckily for us, we had extensive experience, you know, with uh, in, in businesses, we were able to, to research and understand the mechanics of obtaining permits from uh, from different entities, from the city, from the state. And, and Lupita was very uh, researchful on this. And while I was at, at my job, I was able to, you know, on a part-time basis help her guide her through this. It took us a, a, a good couple of years just to start the business. And the business started operations in 2017. And, and we had a, a, an initial business strategy that we wanted to, to go to every store available in the market. And very soon, you know, the, the, our, our product is very dependent on, on tasting, sampling. But then when the pandemic started, that, that kind of made a big shift to the way that we were approaching business. And all of a sudden, you know, the sampling was prohibited all across the state and all the stores. And we found ourselves questioning, you know, what are we going to do now? How do we tell the people who we are and how do we ask them to try what we're making for them? And that took us to re-strategize what we were doing. And, and we decided to, if we were not able to sample and start slow and, 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 and reaching uh, store by store, county by county, well, let's, let's start and, and, and broaden our, our channels. And in one of the events in Farm to Table, we were able to connect with some, some buyers and, and they, that opened up more market opportunities in, in larger counties like King County, you know, Snohomish. And so the, the, the small business that we started or we intended to do and in, the, in the first stage of the business, we started, we started to think a little bigger by force because we just couldn't uh, talk to the customers. Lupita really enjoyed her six months of sampling, talking to the customers. That's what she loved the most, but we, we also needed to take the business and, and, and keep it alive for the, for the time being during the pandemic. So that took us down to Seattle, PCC markets. We were able to connect with some of the buyers. We, we connected with some, some buyers at the restaurants, not institutions yet, because our business also started small because our plan was to start in, in a small market. We wanted to test, but nevertheless, the, the Air Force made us think and, and re-strategize what we were doing. And a year ago, we made a decision that perhaps uh, it would be better for the, for the company to, to survive, to go bigger than what we were. And we, decided to invest some of our, our money, our savings, and, and make the company bigger to continue to increase the outreach. We didn't know what the pandemic was gonna to bring to all of us. And it was upon us and it had been already a year and in closed doors, we couldn't go out anywhere. So just distribution. So we needed more distribution. So that was the big challenge. And with the capacity that we added and now with a new location in Bellingham, we are able to, to, to get into other channels, like we're talking is institutional distribution, getting into more kitchens. And so this is something that the, the pandemic really forces us to become quicker in our decision-making and, and re-strategize and, and perhaps getting a little bit out of our comfort zone. You know, we, we wanted to go little by little, but then uh, the, the situation just made us think different. And we, we had to adjust to the environment at that point. And so far, and we've been in, in our new operation in Bellingham for, for three weeks, and we've been successful, at least in the first production runs. 
And with the added capacity, we are now starting to look for other ways to, to have a bigger outreach. And, and we thank you for the opportunity for being here to speak about our, our situation. And, and, and I could, uh, I could speak, about, speak about any, any other uh, planning tools that you can do when, when you're starting your business small, because it really took a lot of planning and a lot of financial discipline to really weather the storm and get to where we are right now. Thank you so much, Gerardo. And uh, I think that's a great transition um, to talking about, um, you know, shared resources and sourcing. You are a producer, but you are also a buyer as well, right? right. So um, did you experience challenges during the pandemic or, um, yeah, what has been your biggest sourcing problem if you've had one? Well, well I, we have to agree with, with, with Erica's comments, you know, about supply chain. You know, one of those observations that she made was that when you're talking about a, a small supply chain, a local supply chain, is this this pandemic really showed that it's, it's a more reliable supply chain. You know, and in the bigger industries, a lot of the, the companies that were bringing grains overseas were struggling because the grain wasn't reaching the ports. So in our case, you know, partnering with local farmers, local meals, you know, as, as same as them were, we're using Kern Springs and some local oil producers uh, for to source our some of our main ingredients and um, allow us to, to stay without disruptions at all. And and even the, the printing our labels is a local printer. So it, it hasn't been an issue, even for these challenging times that other companies have faced, just because local has proven to be more reliable. A short and strong supply chain compared to international ones. No, and before the, the pandemic, uh, for us was very important to have a really good connection with the, with the, uh, our vendors. And that's why we decided just to buy um, local and have the, the really good connection with them and having them very, very close to us too. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm going to open up this question to the group, so feel free to chime in, popcorn. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious if any of you could share about connections you've been able to uh, make using the Washington Food and Farm Finder. Um, I know the wholesale product finder is still pretty new, but it, it's tied to all of the same data. Have you used the Washington Food and Farm Finder or um, Eat Local First as a tool to make connections? Any highlights that you can share or unique ways you've used it? I know Mark has used it in a couple of different ways. Uh, yeah, so over the years, I've used the, the, the Food and Farm Finder uh, many, many times. And then through uh, the Eat Local First um, campaigns, Sustainable Connections, I uh, did a lot of chef tours and um farmer you know chef meetups and things like that and all of those tools combined have um, really i mean helped me to be able to source all of the things that i do uh, locally so yeah definitely the it's a it's a very good tool the the food and farm finder thank you Mark, did you are you able to share um, from the different hats that you wear the different ways that you use it? Maybe not the obvious. Yeah, I'll use I'll talk about the Food and Farm Finder as a producer. So I'm I'm a meat goat producer, USDA. I try to be for the most part, and uh, so uh, I use it to to list uh, product for uh, potential sale. Um, I don't know if any of the buyers that I've worked with have said that they have actually used uh, the food finder as the source. 
uh, for finding me. Most of it's been word of mouth, I think, or relationship building. Uh, the other way I use it as a producer is when I'm actually looking for other producers similar to me so we can maybe collaborate on shared inputs. You know, other other producers, hey, I'm you know going to be ordering this product or these things, or I'm I'm heading into kidding season and I'm buying, you know, this many bottles or this kind of stuff does, you know. So I, I use it to reach out uh, to find other producers like me for um, uh, for shared inputs for the most part or, or to collaborate on, or maybe, hey, I'm going to the uh, sales yard. Uh, do you have some animals uh, from your place that you wanna deliver this time of year? So, you know, so there's a lot of different ways to be able to use the, uh, to use that tool. Awesome, thank you. And Annette, I don't know if you wanted to chime in at all. Um, any feedback or experience you've gotten as we have just launched the Wholesale Product Finder? Um, have you heard any feedback from folks on interesting ways they've been able to use it? Yeah, um, so we've just launched the, the Wholesale Directory as a tool that wholesale um, school food buyers and emergency food um, buyers can use to locate farms. We've been hearing that it was, they wanna buy local, but they don't know where to find farms or where to buy it from. Um, and there wasn't an easy way to search. So uh, we've just started sharing that information out. Um, I haven't gotten a ton of feedback, but I personally find it really useful um, when schools come to me or districts come to me and say, we're looking for this particular product or we're looking just to see who is in our area. Um, oftentimes the types of advice we give before is check out your local farmer's market. You know, you could Google farms in your area, but now we have this really nice curated list um, of farms that have indicated their interest in selling wholesale to schools with the specific products, their certifications, um, you know, their distribution capacity. So that information is readily available through the finder. And, and I've used it when, when districts reach out to me and say, who can I, who can I buy from? Um, or, and it's not, you have to buy from people listed on the site, but it's just another tool um, that, that we can use to help build those connections. Awesome, thank you. I'm curious, um, just really quickly, if Mark, Patrick, Erica, Will, if you have any um, anecdotal uh, success you can share about forward contracting or, or crop planning. So for example, um, Will and Erica, I know you mentioned needing to look for basil and um, being able to use the Washington Food and Farm Finder to look up um, basil producers nearby. Have you been able to reach out then and you know contract with a grower for what your business actually needs? Um, yeah, yeah, we've uh, we don't necessarily have a contract, but we've sat down with farmers. Um, you know, Cheryl from Cloud Mountain when they were producing um, basil. Um, and now Rob at um, uh, vertical, forget, fog. vertical Fog Farms, um, you know, and then uh, Anna from Osprey, you know, we, we say we need, you know, 200 pounds from a basil during the season from this particular grower, you know, we, we actually need about 600 pounds a season. Uh, and so it takes a few, a few growers to kind of get up to that amount. Um, and so it's good to, you um, um, discuss those things earlier in the season so they know how much to plant um, and that they know that they have a market for, for planting all of that. Um, so I think that uh, definitely those relationships are important, um, but as far as contracts, we, we don't actually use any sort of, you know, like if you don't produce that much basil, then, you know, it's, it's, um, it's more of just the relationship. And I, this is Mark. I want to piggyback on something Will just said, is which is really important, and that's time frame. Uh, let's just you know, just crop producers, annual crop producers. Um, you know, they needed advanced planning uh, to know in the fall to know how much to plant. It's it's kind of hard for, if their product is committed already in April, May, June, to for a buyer to come in and say, hey, you know, um, I'm looking for basil or whatever well you know their their product may already be committed um i i'd say it's it's even longer with meat producers uh you know if i'm a i have a certain number of does I, so i have a certain number of kids each year and 12 months later they're to the age to that they can go to market but 
you know, that it takes time for uh, if somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to, you know, um, some goat meat for a restaurant or a grocery store or whatever that's above and beyond. Well, it's like, do I buy more does so that they can have more kids so that I can wait 12 months to uh, raise these kids to market weight and then get on the schedule for USDA processing? So um, advanced planning and advanced notice, especially for meat producers, is really, really key. Uh, you just can't. You, you know, you, you only have so many animals and, and in a growing market as we come out of COVID into a growing market, I shrunk during COVID because I was really un, unsecure about USDA meat processing and also about where markets were gonna be for goat meat. So I shrunk down. Well, now um, I'm at a point where I'm like, okay, Mark, I'm waiting to see where markets open up. Well, it, it doesn't happen on a dime. So, you know, it takes a lot of advanced planning and a lot of advanced relationships to be able to fulfill market needs um, and, and new opportunities. Hence the need for the farm to table trade meeting to bring everyone together in the planning season and figure out how to set ourselves up for success. And obviously the, the key thread through all of this has been mentioned by everyone is the relationships. Um, the relationships from buyers to producers in, in the business to business sense, but also um, I love Lupita's story and I've seen her uh, at the local co-op sampling her product, right? And people connecting with her and her story and her passion for her product. And um, that's what it, that's what really motivates me in working with um, the Local First Collaborative is that it's so much more than just um, our, our database that's full of information that we can share. We are storytellers and we are a group of uh, organizations across the state dedicated to sharing the story um, of local food and that there is a story behind every meal. Um, and with that, I am going to introduce um, Mariah DeLeo to join us and talk about some of the cool things that are coming up next. And by all means, Mariah, if you'd like to pull anything additional out of our uh, wonderful panelists, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was a really rich conversation. Um, as always, I'm so um, grateful and amazed for the amazing community you all put to, up together. Um, my name is Mariah DeLeo and I'm the Good Food Economy Program Manager here at Seattle Good Business Network. Um, and the Good Food Economy Program is a regional program. So despite the, the name of our organization, um, our program was really built around creating the kind of community that Sustainable Connections has, has brought up in the Northwest Washington area, but here for Central Puget Sound. So we really serve everyone serving Central Puget Sound, which really means everyone here today, most people are selling into kind of our market. Um, and so, but we haven't had as much of the same kind of robust um, networking kind of opportunities here. Um, there were some great organizations in the past, but um, some have kind of um, fallen uh, by the wayside a little bit. And so um, we really have been basically the Good Food Economy program was established in March of um, 2020, um, which is when I came on, which is a wild time to start a new pro food program. Um, but uh, you know we've done a lot in that uh, in that time period, and we're really um, hoping to build with that. Um, and we have worked with um, Sustainable Connections in the past through Eat Local First, and so we're really building off of that um, to help um, with what we're doing now. Uh, so just as a kind of overall. Um, introduction, Seattle Good Business Network started a program called Seattle Made um, around 2015, which uh, supports uh, urban manufacturers in the city of Seattle. Um, and about 40% are food and beverage um, producers. So there was always that, that kind of support service um, for those food manufacturers. Uh, we have also uh, operated Dine Around Seattle and then um, more recently Seattle Restaurant Week. And we are now the sole operators of um, or organizers for Seattle Restaurant Week as well. And so we have a tie to a fairly large and robust network of restaurants as well. Um, half of whom I should say identify as Eat Local First um, pledging eat local first, meaning that they source from two local farms and have an interest in um, uh, 
pledging uh, to increase that by 10%. Um, and so we're really working to tap into that, that network um, to help um, kind of build those connections. And so from Seattle Made and with Seattle Restaurant Week, we, we've kind of used that to help build uh, the Good Food Economy Program, which really does that same networking um, the work of <laughs> bringing people together, connecting people from farm to fishery, uh, food manufacturing, processing, distribution, retail, um, restaurants, and uh, institutions. And so um, one of the things that we've built is an online platform called Good Food Forum, which seeks to do what these kinds of um, conferences do uh, throughout the year. So this is a place where people can come on and post what they have, uh, what they need and what they're offering um, all in one big open space so that they can connect and create those sales relationships, but also resource relationships. Um, I think it was Mark talking about um, how he uses the Washington Food and Farm Finder for other peers, so other manufacturers because of shared inputs or shared resources. Seattle made for you know seven years now has a similar kind of shared um, online platform where they go to each other all the time for, you know, I'm looking for new packaging or I need someone to go in on uh, this flower purchasing or something like that with me. And that's built up really robust and that's what we're building with Good Food Forum um, on that kind of larger scale as well. Uh, we also operate a program called Good Food Kitchens, uh, which is a program where we um, fund restaurants who are providing community meals to those in need um, that really struck up around the pandemic, but has grown. And we now support about 30 restaurants and caterers um, who are providing meals to about 20 different organizations organizations regionally. Um, and they're sourcing from about 11 local farms. Our, our hope is to help increase their ability to support local farms. Um, and one of the biggest things that we find from restaurants and always has is, I have no idea who is out there. <laughs> I'd love to source locally. I don't know what farms are there. I don't know where to find them. Um, or their distributors are not selling necessarily local, a lot of local, um, from local farms either. And so providing just that basic kind of directory resource has been a huge um, focus of our work, um, a big driver of, uh, of what we do. And so we've connected with Sustainable Connections and the Eat Local First Collaborative to go in on a, um, a USDA FMPP grant, which we were awarded to help build the Washington Food and Farm Finder Wholesale Product Finder. Um, it's, it's a tool, I think. We'll, we'll have to talk about the name, I think. <laughs> I still am calling it like five different things. Um, but anyway, this resource that Marissa's um, presented that you all have been using to some degree, um, our, our hope is to help really develop this and make it a, a statewide tool that everyone can use where you can filter, have multiple filters and use it on mobile and all the different ways um, that you use it to find all of the, the local farms and producers that are out there and for those local farms and producers to find buyers. Um, so our timeline around that is really, um, you know, an initial feedback period where we talk to similar to the, to what I think Mark already did with um, their recent project, but a little bit of a fact finding um, uh, uh, period where we're going to go talk to local producers and, and buyers and say, what do you need out of this tool? How is this going to best work for you? What are the barriers that you experience that this tool can maybe help address? Um, and using all of that feedback, we're going to then go into a development period for this tool. And then on the other side, we'll then go out and do um, all the hard work of getting folks to um, get sign their sign themselves up their listings up so producers have buyers on the other end and buyers have producers on the other end um i just want to give kind of a small anecdote um around this work is that you know we've already started kind of our stakeholder list building process i created a very informal um, bipoc owned farm list um, because our good food kitchens partners our restaurant partners were saying 
when we asked, when we were trying to help them with resources to source more locally is I want to support specifically BIPOC owned farms or immigrant and refugee owned farms. And so we started creating this list and we have about 80, I think 80 farms um, listed around the state of Washington. And already by just giving out that simple spreadsheet, that simple directory, we were able to create um, at least, you know, five new um, purchasing relationships within, I think the first two weeks. Um, and those are going to be long term relationships that, of course, build off of each other and, and really help to build this this beautiful community um, and with, that we hope to help see flourish. And um, so we're hoping that this tool is going to be the thing that um, is then our next step in making this a resource that's Washington statewide, that's um, really serving um, all of the stakeholders who are going to be using this program. And yeah, with that, we want to hear from all of you. Um, we are gonna be including a um, questionnaire here at the end of this, um, at the end of this presentation that asks for those of you who want to participate in our feedback um, round, however you wanna do that. If it's a survey, a one-on-one -on -one meeting, maybe a round table, you know, it's your time that we value. And so anytime you're able to give, um, we want to hear from you. And so um, please feel free to let us know. We'll be starting all of our feedback, um, our outreach and uh, feedback within the next couple of months. And so you'll be hearing from Marissa and I and, and our partners at the eLocal First Collaborative um, to, um, start these conversations and start the development of this um, really, really exciting new tool. Um, so that is it for me Do Before we close out, does anybody have um, questions for me or for Marissa in regards to this kind of new project we're working on? Craig, I see that. No, I'm just, I'll just make sure to, that the link is... Um, set up correctly in terms of accessibility. I think I cut off half the link, sorry about that. Oh, got it, okay, good. I was like, I think I thought I said <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, everyone. Mariah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to oh, no, off. I was going to close out and I will let you do that because it's basically just thank you. Yes, I want to thank I want to thank everyone that joined our panel today. Um, several of you are good friends and um, I just appreciate the wealth of knowledge and experience that's represented here and that you're uh, willing to share your time and come and be in relationship with us together. Um, yeah, and we will, as we mentioned before, share out contact information for those that have given us permission to do so. So you'll be able to reach out to any of these fine folks and either ask for um, advice or maybe offer something that you might have um, at your disposable, disposal that they need. Um, so thank you just for being here. And I also just want to mention again, thank you to our uh, friends at Business Impact Northwest and encourage you to check out the rest of the programming this week for Food Biz Week. There are a lot of great um, sessions and more good conversations to be had. And thank you to Mariah and Seattle Good Business Network for being so instrumental in bringing together um, folks from the Puget Sound region and um, I want to thank our team as well. A lot of hard work and, and not enough time has been given to um, introduce Elias Saras, our new food and farm uh, program manager, and Jessica, our new outreach coordinator. But we are so happy to have them and have a full team once again. And who knows, maybe we will actually be able to do this uh, together in person next year. Um, and then I just want to also say again, thank you to our sponsors and our funders, um, Whatcom Community Foundation especially funds so much of our work and makes it possible for us to do this event every year. We hope that you will join us again next year. Um, 
and I am happy to stay on a couple more minutes and I'm, I'm sure a couple other folks are too if there are questions, um, but we are at 2.15. So if you need to go, please do so and um, stay in touch. Hey, Mark.